Good morning, everyone. Welcome to an all-new edition of On The Mark TV and Radio from Westfield Community Programming, 89.5 FM WSKB, and our media partners at Southwick Community Television and Agawa Media. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach, and today we're getting a chance in this program to talk with two people who have mastered the art of photography and cinematography. Our first guest is the official photographer for Good Speed Musicals down in East Adam, Connecticut, Diane Sobolewski. She has photographed every production since 1985. And if you go to Good Speed's website or you look on their social media, you see these fabulous photographs of the performances of musicals, from old musicals to new musicals. It's, this is all Diane's work. And to me, I'm in awe of how somebody can go into a darkened theater with a camera and capture the essence of of a musical. It's not a play where people are standing still, but a, a performance form where people are moving constantly, whether they're dancing or singing or in a duet or an ensemble. And first of all, welcome, Diane. And how did you and Goodspeed come together? Hi, Mark. It's uh, nice to meet you. I've read your work. Uh, we've never actually met face to face. So in the, this day of Zoom, here we are meeting over Zoom. But Thank you so much for your very kind words. Uh, that really makes all my efforts worthwhile to hear someone like yourself have such a reaction. Um, the way I hooked up with Goodspeed was in 1985, I was working as the Hartford Whalers team photographer for the National Hockey League. And I heard that Goodspeed was looking for a photographer to come and do some black and white work because the, they didn't have an official photographer at the time. And uh, the person doing it was doing it sort of as a hobby, you know, contributing photos, covering enough, but not on an, an official basis. And certainly back in 1985, it was a lot different than it is now. Um, so I went down and I talked to them. And um, I think the very first thing I ever did was uh, go to rehearsal in Chester and shoot some photographs of a show called The Dream Team, which was about Negro League baseball. And it, in all these years, the irony is never lost on me that it was, I went, I came from a sports background to shooting in theater a show about sports but anyway um it i stayed on doing all the black and white for a little bit and eventually evolved evolved into uh where i was doing all the photography work for the opera house including all the shows at both theaters all special events um but it, it started that way it's it's typical you know word of mouth right place at the right time and uh it's gone on from there and one thing we're going to tell audiences while we're chatting with Diane, we're going to show some of her photos. So if you happen to be listening to the show today on radio as opposed to watching it on TV, go back to WSK Community Radio's YouTube page and watch the TV version, and you'll get to see some of these great photographs. So my, my question is, um, when you are... Like South Pacific is the show that most recently opened. Um, when, how long in advance did you know that you'd be photographing it? And how many rehearsals or performances did you get to go to before you actually did the photography? Well, I, I become aware of what shows are coming up when the season uh, schedule is announced. You know, I find out when everybody on the staff finds out, then it's released to the public, of course. But... Um, maybe it would be helpful if I just give you a rundown of what we do for each show. Yeah, I'm really uh, curious because, yeah. um, you know, I, when I get there on press night, on opening night, I get a file of photographs that you've done so that I can pick and choose what I'm going to use okay. with my reviews and other things. But they're very carefully selected, So, uh, and there are so many of them that are uniquely different. There's got to be a, a formula to how you make it work work well uh, prefacing me telling you what the actual work structure is and and forgive me i as you probably can tell i'm way more comfortable on my own side of the camera as opposed to talking into one but um let me just say that the uh marketing and press department at good speed is outstanding uh dan mcmahon is the head of it and i worked very closely with katie desjard and, and she is responsible for putting that press packet you get on press opening uh, she 
after I do my edit of the photos, she edits and selects the moments we want to represent to the press and, you know, get, put the best foot forward on the show. But I feel that we've got a really strong team there. We work really well together. But um, anyway, for each show, uh, what I ha have to do is I go in on the first day of rehearsal, which is, it's uh, traditionally been called Bagel Rama at Goodspeed because bagels, coffee, tea, juice is available. And it's sort of like the first day of summer camp. Everybody, the whole staff is there, the entire company um, meets, introduces themselves. We meet the cast, then we disperse, but I stay on. And if there are design presentations at that uh, gathering, I photograph those. The director always has a few words to say. So it's at that point I start to get a feel for the show and hopefully I'm familiar with whatever show is being presented. But the next step after that is a table reading, which is just like you see it in Hollywood movies where the cast is sitting around a table reading out of the book. Uh, almost always we have music. So it's good if they're interacting and looking up, giving me photo opportunities. So I, I just cruise quietly around the room and photograph that. Um, after that, I'm just going to refer to my notes and make sure I cover everything. After that, we do what we call setups, which are pre-publicity photos. And what we do is try to give the look that the show is going to have, whether years ago we used to go on location, for instance, for Camelot, we went up to Gillette's Castle and took some of the actors up there and it uh, reenacted some scenes just to give a flavor. Because at that point, we don't have a set, we don't have a stage to put them on. Um, so we have those setup pre-publicity photos. Now they're pretty much, um, I want to say almost like portraiture. Uh, we do them in conjunction if a TV ad is being made by the Opera House for the show, where they're very graphic, so that there's something to put out there for the show before it gets on stage. After that, the next step is dress rehearsal, and that's where the majority of the photographs that you see come from. Uh, it's shooting a show as it runs straight through. It's, it's as if I'm there at a performance. And, you know, there's no audience in the theater, so I get free reign to move around. Um, ideally, I'm presenting what the show looks like, but also being creative, finding different angles. But with good speed, it's always, you know, you know there'll be big dance numbers, and those are uh, honestly some of my favorites. But capturing the feeling of the show. Um, after that, I turn all the photos into the press department, which... Generally, after I've edited them, they could number 1,500 from a, a dress rehearsal. Uh, Katie goes through them, pulls out ones that we might need to redo at a staged photo call, which takes place after a performance. And there we go and just clean up things because with the full, dan full stage dance numbers at good speed, invariably spacing might be off a little when I shot it the night before. And they're still working. They're still fine tuning the wonderful work. And... Um, you know, if we need to improve the lighting just a little bit, but still maintaining exactly what the show looks like. Then the press packet's put together for you, and uh, that's pretty much it. But within there, to familiar, getting back, I think, sort of to your original question, how do I familiarize myself with the show, is I go and see a run-through in the, pardon me, in the uh, rehearsal studio, so I can get a feel of the flow to it. It doesn't look like what, exactly what it's going to be on stage, because they're in the studio, but at least it gives me an idea. So actually my preliminary view of the show is limited. Um, so I try to get familiar as familiar as possible. Dress rehearsal is really kind of a one and done and that's my one chance to get it right uh, until we fine tune a handful of shots at photo call. And um, beyond that, that's pretty much it now for every show. So there are multi steps and layers to doing it. But um, I, I think we work work it out well and the you know we get great cooperation with the actors for the most part there's very few times when there have been any difficulties or any hiccups along the way but um that's pretty much the process now i noticed that you shared a lot of your photographs with me and i've of course had the opportunity to see them over the years um mm -hmm. one of them that you shared was the musical abyssinia which you said was your favorite musical of all times working at good speed and that and some of the earlier stuff was in black and white and then it morphed into color um, right. When did you when did you start shooting in color? Um, I uh, since I started in 1985 with just the black and white. Then a few years in, I started doing both black and white and color. And this was all film. And I, when I think back to it now, it's, it almost feels like the dark ages. I was juggling two cameras, having trying to have two brains, thinking, oh, that should be a black and white shot. That should be a color shot. Um, 
and I did. And in those days, film was never agreeable with theatrical lighting, so it, you know it was kind of a challenge. But um, I want to, as again, <laughs> again, make sure I get the date right. In two thousand two, was when we converted all to digital, and that was a that was great for me. I'm not a techno nerd, as they say, so I don't get into the weeds of uh, technology, but I am still a, a purist in f terms of wanting to make a great original at the beginning, but digital photography in, in theater is fantastic because if need be, you can correct color a little bit. Uh, the light sensitivity is totally different. So, and, and it's just a different way of shooting in, in terms of equipment. It's simplified things. I'm, it's one camera. I'm, I'm not thinking which should be color, which should be black and white. So, um, but it's funny, when I went back in the archives to pull pictures for you, looking at those black and white images, and when you refer to Abyssinia, which is really my all-time favorite show anywhere, um, there's something to the texture and the feel to the black and white that, that's just different than on film that you'll never see in digital. But, but, that, but that's just the way it is with all photography. Yeah, and of course, if, when you look at things now that are in black and white, I mean, they're very vintage in their way, but there's also a very film noir uh, look to them. Yes. Well, I realize, though, that years from now, 100 years from now, your photography will be the images that people will remember of good speed musicals uh, over the years. You are the uh, keeping the legacy of what happened on stage alive for future uh, generations to look at, uh, the, the record. Um, does good speed t videotape for the archives? Yes, they do. Um, there's an, a date set a little bit into each run where an archival recording is made, so. That's all done by another uh, crew of two people who do a, a wonderful job. They also come in if good speed, and mainly for the main stage uh, for our productions. If a TV ad is going to be made, that same crew works on that. But uh, yes, good speed in the, its huge archives has videos of everything. Yeah, that, That's separate from my work. How did you get involved in photography? What attracted you to it, and uh, how did you get started? Well, I can remember always being attracted to photography, even as a young child. And uh, I went to college to be an architect. <laughs> and I changed my major uh, into the School of Public Communications at uh, Syracuse University, but not in photography, in uh, graphic arts, which was basically graphic arts production. There was one photography course that was taught by former Navy photographers who were a crazy crew, <laughs> literally. And, but I'm self-taught, uh, so going into the class at Syracuse, it just kind of fine-tuned some darkroom techniques for me. But I am self-taught, and um, I, again, right place at the right time, got the job with the Whalers, and uh, then heard, of, heard that Goodspeed needed someone to uh, help them out. But it's always been a passion of mine, and I, it's never, ever lost on me that I get to work at something I truly love doing. And if someone said to me years ago, where would you like to work? I would have said, I'd like to be a hockey photographer and I'd like to be a theater photographer. And the Whalers moved to North Carolina and abandoned me. And uh, <laughs> thankfully I'm still on with Goodspeed. Um, is Goodspeed your only uh, photography role or do you uh, photograph for other theaters or other entities? Uh, at the moment, Goodspeed is pretty much it. Uh, over time, when converting into digital, now it's been quite a few years, a lot of little jobs sort of dried up once everybody owned an iPhone. All the little PR jobs that used to get called in for, uh, people could do them themselves. I used to do a lot of sports for Yale. Um, I Fortunately, it, the type of work with both when I was with the Whalers and uh, naturally at good speed, you meet a lot of people. and. People look for photographers still from time to time, even though everybody fancies themselves a pro uh, with the iPhones. But I don't do weddings. I've done them for friends. But, uh, you know, basically right now, Goodspeed is my main job. It's They've sent shows on to uh, Broadway, and my work has transferred to a couple shows there. I did one show for uh, Gabe Barry, who's a wonderful director who's worked a lot at Goodspeed when the show John and Jen transferred off Broadway. He had me come down to New York and um, photograph it. 
And just a quick note on that. He gave me one of the greatest compliments I've ever gotten. He said they were in rehearsal. It was a two person show and he couldn't get across to the two actors what he wanted. And he had a handful of my black and white prints. And so finally in his frustration, he took the photos out and said, showed them the pictures and said, do this. And then they got it. And that, to me, you know, if that, if I represented his work so well that he could just show someone what he wanted, that, that says a lot for me. You, you, since you're part of the of the Goodspeed family, and it seems that there are mm -hmm. a lot of directors that return every couple of seasons, uh, Jen Thompson, Rob Ruggiero mm -hmm. are a couple that come to mind that you see, or choreographers like Parker S., who just did South Pacific, who's been there before. Um, when a show moves on to New York and you're working with new people, does it pose challenges to you? Or um, is it getting to work with a new team kind of exciting? It's exciting because Goodspeed always brings in great creative people. And now we're meeting a lot of new younger people. And actually, for me, since I've done this almost it's 39 years this year. Um, but yeah, it's funny you named some of my favorites right there, Rob Ruggiero, Jen Thompson, Gabe Barry, as I mentioned, Parker Essay, Esse, uh, one of my favorite uh, chore choreographers. Dan Serretta at the beginning was fantastic to photograph. Um, his work was so athletic. And, and it's, it is, it's interesting. It really is. And now with the, the different uh, material and different productions that Goodspeed is doing, it's a challenge for each one, but it, it, invariably, Everyone's great to work for or in with, and you get a lot of good cooperation. And, um, you know, we're all there for the same purpose to put the best foot forward for each show. And, uh, but it, it is, it is a new challenge each time out. I got to say that a photograph that was in my press kit last year for summer stock of Corbin Blue jumping, <laughs> you sent it, and I hope we can show it. Um, uh, to me, that is just such a stunning photograph that is, it's pure artistry. Oh, thank you so much. I think, you know, in all modesty, that might be one photograph that I am most proud of over the years. And I can give the uh, backstory on that. It is a, naturally a moment from the show, but it is a moment from our photo call. And Corbin was a dream to photograph. He's such a talented dancer and great performer and just a really very nice person. And we had him do that a few times, jumping off the table. But again, that's where I think my sports background sort of comes in. I, I've sort of become known, especially among the people at Good Speed, that I can always catch the actors, as we say, off the deck of, of the stage in leaps and even, you know, ensemble shots. But that photograph of Corbin, I, you know, I, I'm really happy with that, too. So I'm glad you like it. Oh, I loved it. Um, I mean, I have a couple of show uh, that I've seen at Goodspeed where your photography stands out in my mind after I've forgotten about the show. And like you, I uh, have to go through reviews every once in a while and pull things together. But some of the work you did on rags uh, I thought was, <laughs> was stunning photography. And, uh, you know, I went a couple of months ago, I was going through and archiving some reviews to see what I wanted to save for my files. And so I'm always going back to your photography. And uh, a couple of questions that people ask me to ask you, what kind of camera do you use? I use can all Canon equipment. Uh, I even from my film days, I was, well, when I started, it was manual focus, then we went, of course, autofocus. And then I just converted to digital Canon uh, equipment. And how, it, how do you store your photos? Um, uh, or how do you archive them uh, so they maintain everything about them in a year from now or 10 years from now? Well, everything goes to Goodspeed via Dropbox. So on their end, I'm assuming they're archiving them as well. But I'm very, uh, I don't know, <laughs> anal is the proper word on saving things in terms of the images. All, all the film is archived in my our own personal archives. Um, so that's all stored safely. The digital uh, work, I say that I'm probably a little old school on this too. I still burn CD, a uh, record CD of each show or each event that I do, but I, I store everything on a hard external hard drive. And I'm back up to that external hard drive because 
you never know. Uh, technology can fail us at any point. And, uh, you know, I, I like to have redundancy to make sure that it, it's there and uh, preserved also for good speed. You know, if something gets lost on their end, I'll have it. Were there any photographers along the way that influenced your work? Um, in theatrical photography, I naturally looked at Martha Swope and Joan Marcus uh, out of New York. But honestly, and again, in all due modesty, I, I feel I have my own style. You know, we all sort of, you know, there, there's just certain so many certain ways you can photograph something. But at good speed, I'm limited, as, as everyone knows, to the size of the theater and the size of the stage. And I'm among everybody else that marvels at what gets put on that stage and what gets done, particularly dancing. I, it'll never cease to amaze me as, as to what is accomplished. Um, so again, that's where when I photograph a show, I'm looking at it really from the point of view of the audience so that when you said you like to go back and look at the different photographs, and, and I'm very flattered by that, Mark. I think you're my new number one fan from meeting you and hearing you today. But um, one patron one night said to me, your photos are souvenirs. And it really struck home with me because I can remember as a child, my family used to go to those ice shows like the ice capades. And my parents would always buy a souvenir for my sister and me, which would be the glossy program. And I would look at it and think, oh, I remember that moment from a show. So that's in my way of thinking when I photograph a show. A, naturally, I want to produce the work for the, that the press department needs. But B, it should look like the show that people saw. But C, also letting me be creative and find different angles. That's where it's nice having the luxury of moving in the theater uh, during dress rehearsal. I can move up close to the stage or off to the side and, and add my own touches and add my own creativity. So um, I think we all try to find our own style, but uh, sometimes there's, there's just some pretty basic things you want to accomplish regardless. Do you have a website where, or a social media where people can look at your work, or do they basically have to go to good speed? Uh, sadly, no. I am not on social media. I embarrassingly do not have a website. But if you go to, like you said, if you go to the good speed website, goodspeed.org, uh, it's all there. And if you just work through the web, website, if you go to past productions, there, there's a sampling of each uh, show, pretty much back to the early 2000s. Um, not all the film shows are there, but, uh, and I have not digitized my film library. That would take me the rest of my life. So, yeah, I, uh, I would hope that down the road, Goodspeed might consider doing a coffee table book of some of your photography, because I think that not only is it good theater photography, but it stands on its own. I mean, somebody could really get a feeling for the American musical just looking at the various musicals from old and new that you have an opportunity to do at Goodspeed. No, oh, thank you. That's very flattering. Um, it, it's coincidentally when different people have left good speed to go on to different employment or retirement or whatever. Uh, a souvenir book for them, a gift book has been put together that will archive their, the shows that were done over the duration of their employment, 10, 15 years, whatever. Um, and looking at those, sometimes I think, Oh, wow, I did all that. But, uh, and so that's kind of is a good sprinkling, a good sampling of uh, my work, but yeah, I would be interested in, in something like that. I, I think it would, uh, you know, it would be like a permanent, because I'm still hands-on. I, I still like to ha be able to hold something and look at it and not have everything be electronic. Well, Diane, it's been a pleasure to meet you today. I love your photography. I'm a major fan. And I hope that people might uh, get a chance to look at it. You can find out about what's happening at Good Speed Musicals and look at some of Diane's photography at their website, which is Goodspeed. Dot org, and they're very active on social media, so you can go to Facebook as well and see some of Diane Sobolewski's photographs. And I hope I get to meet you in person one day when I get to come to the next press opening. Oh, I hope we get to meet too, Mark. It's really been a pleasure today, and uh, thank you so much for your very, very kind words about my work, and 
I'll just keep doing it. <laughs> keep, keep on doing it. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to take a break to acknowledge the underwriters that make On the Mark and other programs here possible. And we'll be back with more, so don't go away. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. We'll be right back. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Dunkin' Donut Shops of Westfield and the Sardinia family. It's nice to know that even as the world changes, Dunkin' Coffee remains the same at seven convenient locations throughout Westfield. I'm Mark Auerbach. Join me every Friday at 8 a.m. for Arts Beat, where you'll meet interesting actors, directors, designers, and musicians here in Western New England. Community Radio. 89.5 WSKB. Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 at 89.5 FM, WSKB Westfield. Welcome back to On The Mark, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach. Here in the studio with me is my pal, Carl Bartels. He's a Springfield born and bred guy who was a photographer. And in the first half of the program, we, we met Diane Sobluski, who is the, was the, is the staff photographer for Goodspeed. And I remember when I came to Springfield and worked at the Springfield Symphony Orchestra, you were the staff photographer, and we got to work together on many programs, not only in Symphony Hall, but at Stanley Park here in Westfield. And there were um, several seasons that the Springfield Symphony toured uh, throughout New England or did the Berkshire Choral Festival, and you were always there with your camera taking pictures. <laughs> True enough, yep. And, and then you, you got tired of Springfield and you went to California. How did that happen? Well, it's it really a really long story. I'll try to keep it very short and give you the Reader's Digest version. Um, I was trying to learn how to light bigger things, you know, big spaces. And I was also started to get interested in motion picture. So I started interning in Boston uh, at a little camera, you know, production house, camera rental company. And I just was like, oh my God, this is, the, this is it. So, but a year later I was off to, uh, I got accepted to the uh, program at the American Film Institute in LA and I went there for a year and um, after that it was just one thing after another so it was a I wouldn't say a smooth transition but it was pretty straightforward now your career uh, you've done cinematography yep and you've directed some things yeah yeah what does a cinematographer do versus a director of a movie oh um, well we're called a, a DP, a director of photography, or a cinematographer. They're interchangeable. And <clears throat> the director's responsible for everything. They're, they have to sign off on everything that goes on. And the cinematographer is in charge of the frame. You know, in my little viewfinder, I see, I'm the first one to see the movie. And so I direct the lighting, the camera moves or not, uh, what lens, where do we put the camera, and style of lighting and a lot of this most of this is all in collaboration and meetings with the director so he or she and i will meet often maybe two weeks worth of meetings and two or three weeks uh scouting locations deciding what where when like that and um so you have to know your technical stuff but it's also about the artistic is it more difficult to film in a studio or on location? Well, location is obviously has its challenges. It's more interesting. But studio, has you have more control. Like if you are designing, helping design the sets and, you know, with regard to, okay, here's the lighting style. We need to design the sets so that when we have a camera angle. Um, an example would be um, um, House of Cards. David Fincher is the executive producer and directs a lot of the episodes. And he had the sets built with an eye to composition. He's a big composition guy, as are we all. And that's harder to do in a studio unless you have control over the design of the sets. Whereas in location, you find something that lends itself to the story. I know that I'm on the uh, steering committee of the Berkshire Film and Media Collaborative, which is an organization, a nonprofit that is uh, helping 
filmmakers find locations to film at in Western Mass with the idea that the more work that comes here, the more work there is for subsidiary people and the more income from, for example, a, a movie comes to shoot hotel rooms, food, caterers, and, yep. and stuff like that. Carpenters, and, things like you know, that. I, sure. What, they did have somebody come up to look at locations. They wanted some kind of rural New England. And they, they found that it was challenging because the, not only did the weather make a difference, but the lighting, uh, the, the fall days, the, the days are shorter. And so you have less time, for example, to, that you're able to film and get that ideal lighting with the fall foliage background yep. that you can't... That, Working in a studio with a green screen like we have right here is, is a whole different ball of wax. It is. Um, there's now uh, this big LED, that whole studio is one big LED screen. Um, and you can actually shoot plates and you can play them back in real time with actors and like that. The problem is um, you can't move that much because you're going to run out of screen. So... Now it's a whole different ball of wax. Yeah, they have three-dimensional, 360-degree uh, abilities now. You know, it's a million cameras all over the place. And, uh, but it's, unless you have a budget, it's not practical. The thing about shooting in New England or a place like New England, um, especially exteriors, you're going to have rain, you're going to have wind, you're going to have beautiful fall foliage and great uh, production value. So you have to, look at your script and go, well, if it's raining, can I just say, okay, it's raining and we shoot in the rain. Rain, I love rain, I love snow. Um, it's miserable, but it looks great. You know, I can't tell you how many things we've, we've shot, it, it was raining, it was like, yep, looks great, let's shoot it, right? And we just <laughs> keep the actors from getting drowned. Uh, a lot of people that know you from you know, when, when we all, were all like young in, in Springfield starting to make our way, they said, what kind of work did Carl do when he went to California? What are some of the highlights of your resume that you're the proudest of, of like three or four things that you did over the years that if somebody say, what, the films that you worked on that meant a lot to you? Um, I think early on, you know, you're doing a lot of things that were kind of cool, but kind of stupid. And yeah, like that. It wasn't until um, maybe the late 90s, early 2000s, where I started to work with directors or directors I'd worked with who now had budgets where the movies are have more meat to them, better stories. Exception being one of the movies, my, my, one of my closest to my heart is um, Craig Ross and I shot a movie he directed, I shot. It was just literally he and I. He did the sound, I did the camera. I pulled focus, he pushed the dolly. Um, it was very hard, but it was my first movie, and uh, it, it won all kinds of awards. It was shot in black and white, and um, from that we got many, many more movies came our way. So there's that, which is very close to my heart. The second one uh, later um, was a thing called Offside, which was a, it only had five lines of dialogue in 13 minutes. And it was a short that won all kinds of awards at Sundance. And that plus other things co conspired to get me noticed by Luke Besson, who um, um, produced the Taken series with Liam Neeson. And that being asked to be a camera and do some second unit directing and things like that was extremely, um, uh, it, it was a great honor because of enormous budgets and lots of um, really cool things. And working with a guy like Liam, I gotta tell you, there are actors who are very needy, very high maintenance. Liam is not that guy. All Liam wanted was give me a pop-up tent and some water and a chair. That was how, how, main, how high maintenance he was. And uh, very collaborative, it was great. Great working with a guy like that. What made you decide to move back east? Um, I've worked, Mark, in, I think, 
44 states and about 16 or 17 countries. And if you add that up, film and documentary and things like that, not even including my still work, um, I wasn't in LA that much. You know, there were times when, like when Sonora and I got married, I left the next day to work on a, a series. So it was like uh, I was gone maybe six months out of the year. And um, I realized after a while, we got tired of the LA vibe and we wanted quality of life. Uh, we moved back here because of family. And I still have my contacts and we'll shoot in Atlanta. I've got a movie coming up in Greece in a couple months. Um, and so it's like, why do I need to be in LA? So that's part and parcel. When you came back, uh, you know, when you left, uh, this was sort of a cultural desert in a lot of ways. The Berkshires had some theater going, but it wasn't really a dynamic, creative economy. And you come back, and there are so many filmmakers and actors and playwrights and composers that are living in Western Mass in northern Connecticut. And uh, the, the area is thriving with work opportunities. Mm -hmm. Did that surprise you? Um, a little, you know, when I, uh, when we, when we moved here, we didn't, I wasn't expecting a lot of local work because I still had a lot of other things going on. Um, but now, it, like you said, there's a lot going on and I, I want to be part of that. You know, and I'll, like for instance, uh, um, the Berkshire Collaborative, there's a similar thing in Albany called the 518, uh, film, uh, collaborative I think yeah and I go up there periodically to uh, to do master classes and teach and um, uh, going up in November actually um, to help deepen their talent pool so the idea is um, if you have the besides the location if you have talent you you can draw more people like you said earlier to uh, film here you know uh, like right now, Atlanta's the hot spot because they have the big studio, um, huge talent pool, and um, equipment rentals, things like that. You know, you've got to have a, um, a combination of equipment availability, talent pool, uh, good locations, and or studios. And uh, once you've got two or three of, out of the four of those, you're in good shape. Oddly enough, um, a lot of filming is happening here uh, in Western Mass two movies that made the Oscar nominations last year were filmed here. Oh. One is The Holdovers mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Paul Giamatti and that was filmed in Franklin County, Northfield, Mount Hermon, Deerfield Academy, Greenfield and the other was Maestro about Leonard Bernstein that was filmed at Tanglewood. Yep. And there are currently several film crews uh, not only for uh, motion picture, you know, like commercial pictures but also documentaries and uh, you know, commercial, uh, for bank commercials, stuff like that, that are being filmed up and down the valley all the time. Yep. And uh, people seem to like filming here because you have four seasons kind of uh, appeal. You have urban, you could film in Springfield or Holyoke or Pittsfield. You have rural. And the cost of filming here is much less than it would be in New York or L.A. Right, exactly. Um the what you just mentioned is uh, production value. Where in LA you don't have, you can find snow in the winter if you go up north, uh, or up in the mountains. Um, there's deserts, but you don't really have fall foliage, and you don't have that lovely uh, winter vibe where the roads are all slushy and things like that. Uh, which is why I saw um, the the holdovers, and I thought they sh they filmed it in. At, at Williams College, because it felt like it wanted to be Williams College, and um, but the the sort of bleak, cold you know vibe of it really lent itself to the story. So I I love the holdovers because it was filmed at my high school, and actually they had to make snow. Oh really? To film it because it was filmed a couple of winters ago when we had no snow. And uh, there were a lot of work done, and it was done, filmed on location during the January break when the kids were uh, off. Right. And they, that crew came in and filmed quickly. Yep. And they were at Deerfield Academy as well. And they recreated 
winter. In winter, that wasn't winter. Well, you had the cold. Yeah. So you can make snow. That's all you need. <laughs> yeah. We're going to take a real fast break to acknowledge the underwriters that make this program on the mark and other programs possible here on Westfield Community Programming, 89.5 FM WSKB, Agawam Media, and Southwood Community Television. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. We'll return after these messages. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Barnes and Noble College Bookstore in the Ely Campus Center. Offering Westfield State t-shirts, sweatshirts, and gift merchandise. All of your academic needs and offering textbook materials in new, used, ebook, and rental formats. Available at the bookstore on campus or online at westfieldstate.bncollege.com. Underwriting support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Greater Westfield Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business for the greater Westfield communities. Informing, educating, advocating, the Chamber provides opportunities for members to make meaningful connections on local, regional, and state levels. For more information on the Chamber's many events, workshops, and programs, as well as the benefits of membership, visit westfieldbiz.org. The Chamber focuses on the most important economy, yours. Hi, this is Harry Rock, host of Rock on Westfield every fourth Wednesday at 8 a.m. Tune in for my view of this place I call home. Community Radio. 89.5 WSKB. Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 at 89.5 FM WSKB Westfield. Welcome back to On The Mark, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach. If you've missed a part of today's program or you want to watch it again or share it with friends, it's archived along with all of our other programming on YouTube under WSKB Community Radio. My guest this half hour is the cinematographer Carl Bartels. He's from Springfield originally, had an up-and-coming uh, career as a filmmaker uh, and photographer here in Springfield. Then he went out to L.A., had an even bigger career, and now came back here to western New England because he wanted to be closer to his friends and family. But for you, you can, as long as there's an airport like Bradley, you can be wherever you need to be. Totally. Yep. It goes everywhere. <laughs> so what, what, what are your uh, upcoming projects that you're going to be working on over the next six months? Um, well, again, uh, there's a, a movie in Greece that's... Um, out there in the ether, we're not sure when. Uh, it's a follow-up to another movie I shot a couple of years ago. Same director. And uh, right now, I've, I'm doing a lot of writing. Uh, I've, I've written two screenplays, and I'm working, revising one of them uh, with an eye to bringing it back to Sony. Um, several years ago, um, before COVID, um, everything's before COVID. That was the right thing. Um, I, I. One, oh, I didn't win. I came in quarterfinals in the Page Awards, which is kind of a big deal. And uh, if you know screenwriting. And um, from that, I got a, into a room at Sony to do a pitch session. So that went well. And then, of course, COVID happened. So now we're reviving it and going back and, you know, uh, with hopefully a tighter script and uh, uh, more to show. Do you like writing screenplays? I love it. Uh, the only problem is you're sitting most of the time, which I'm not used to. Uh, I never sit, uh, unless I'm in a car. Um, but I started writing several years ago, and it, it just, uh, something, it's the process. I just love the process. And uh, how, how long does it take for you to complete a screenplay? It varies. Uh, the, fir the first one went fairly quickly. It's not a bad story, but, uh, you know, it didn't go anywhere. Um, the second one is a period piece set during World War II, and I had to spend a lot of time researching to get the history correct. So I spent maybe six months of research, and maybe I don't remember, but at least two years of writing. So it takes time. It's not something you whip off during a weekend. A, lo a lot of people ask um, how the pandemic and the COVID changed how you work. 
Um, were you able to work at all during the pandemic, or were you pretty much isolated? Um, I was teaching. I, ta- I used to teach part-time at New York Film Academy in, uh, in L.A. and uh, cinematography and uh, documentary. <clears throat> and I continued to do that because it was online during COVID. And slowly we got back into uh, the real world. But uh, filming, very rarely, uh, the only way you could film during COVID was if you had a closed campus where no one goes in, no one goes out. Everyone's tested like every day. And um, that's not something I ever did. I know a couple of people that did that. It was like, nope. <laughs> but it must have had an impact on you personally in terms of the way you worked. Uh yeah, I mean, you had limitations, certainly, but then Zoom appeared, and that helped meetings and online teaching and uh, location scouting, but uh, you really couldn't film on a Zoom. It so. was interesting for us because, you know, Zoom was here, and we could do phone interviews and all of that, but um, as you can tell from the way the studio, our studio's built, I could come in here and do... Uh, radio and TV work with Zoom and never be in physical contact with my engineer or producer. So we were able to, it was business as usual here. Hmm. And occasionally somebody um, would want to come in and do an interview live. And we were six feet apart at different ends of the table. So I never missed a day of work during the pandemic, I was able to do stories that I never would have been able to do before because a lot of people had things they wanted to talk about. Mm-hmm. And I was, I felt very fortunate. Yeah. Yep. You know, there's always a silver lining. There is, there yep. is. And I think that as we came back to quote business as usual and the theaters and the people that I interview and doing my arts programming, it was coming back to business as usual. It was, but it was different. And um, I think that people have a real appreciation for having a normalcy in their life that, and a life that they took for granted before. Oh, yeah. I don't know about you, but I took a lot of my life for granted until it was taken away. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, driving around, I, I could drive around L.A. and there was no one in the streets. It was like y- you couldn't buy that. Uh, just empty streets. Uh, an occasional someone. But, uh, yeah, and then you start realizing, yeah, we miss the interaction. You know, without the actual tactile <clears throat> in-person interaction, uh, life gets a little, little shaky. You know, it, it's, uh, it's very insular. And it's not my thing. <laughs> if you could, it, the Carl Bartels that started out as a photographer in Springfield, did you ever have any idea back then that you would be where you are now? No. No. It didn't occur to me until the late 80s when I was struggling to learn about how to light big things. Uh, the biggest thing I, I lit back then were uh, stadiums like the um, uh, Boston Garden and the Omni in Atlanta, things like that for like basketball or whatever. And that was almost formulaic because of what it was. And, um, but now uh, I know the, I could light an entire neighborhood. I could light a whole street. And I know the units I would need. I would know the generators. I know what crew I'd need to hire, uh, what lenses, what everything. So that was something I never really got because I, I would think of a space like this, you know, that, about as big as it was, unless it was an exterior. What got you into photography at the get-go? What made you decide to do it? Well, way back in the day, that's, uh, I honestly don't remember. I guess I always had a camera, and I, I, I blame it on my mom. She always had this, uh, in fact, I, I still have that camera, a Kodak Brownie with a flash, and she would line us up, at Christmas, birthday parties, whatever, and blind us with the flash. When I was about 12, I finally said, enough of that shit. Uh, I'm going to take the camera. I'm going to do all the pictures. I, I'm not feeling having this blast in my face. So uh, that kind of got me into learning how to see through a viewfinder 
and realizing that you could leave out things you didn't want in there. So you literally could create your own world. And from there, it was just building on different cameras and lenses and opportunities. And then uh, eventually, I just sort of said, this is crazy. I'm not doing anything except photography. I may as well just decide I'm, that's, who I, that's who I am. Did you go to school and study photography? Mm -mm. No. So you're basically self-taught. Yep. Yep. Um, I, I, for filmmaking, I, I spent a year at AFI to learn the tools, you know, the cranes, the dollies, uh, the lights, uh, the, you know, storytelling, things like that. So, but my grounding was in all the technical and artistic what's a frame look like? What do we need to do to tell a story in a picture? And that helped out hum humongously uh, when I went to LA. There's a lot of people still working cinematographers who are at the low end, don't know how to tell a story with a camera. You know, they, they just don't realize where to put the camera. They're trying to make pretty and they don't understand storytelling. One last question. Is there a particular cinematographer or film director who's your hero? Uh, a lot of them. Many, many, many. Uh, Alan Davio, who passed a few years ago, um, he shot Color Purple and a lot of the early Spielberg things. Uh, David Fincher, director, um, master of composition. Um, David Lean, you know, I, I'll never forget. I used to... Um, uh, tell my mom I was going to go to the library downtown from 16 Acres. I did, in fact, do that periodically. What I really did was I parked my bike and walked across the street to what was a theater back then. And I remember seeing several movies, but then one day uh, they had Lawrence of Arabia. And I sat there, I think it was the, the re, where they had redone it. And I sat there and I went, this... That's a real movie. And from there, I started researching who shot it, who directed it, who, who, who were the actors, you know, and I started learning not only the process, but who the players are and who, so from that, I started finding out everything David Lean directed and I watched it and studied it. And one of the things I did that was interesting, I, start, I realized when I was studying film I was getting distracted by the dialogue, the sound, the music, and all this other stuff. So I shut the sound off, and I only watched the picture. And from there, you see things that you never see with the that sound is, on. That is so true. That is something that I have done to, to look at a, a film and to see really how the sound and the score impacts what's on the screen. Carl, we're out of time, but I want to thank you for coming into the studio today. It's always great to hang out with you. Always a pleasure, Mark. And this wraps up this edition of On the Mark TV and Radio. Peter Coles has been our chief engineer. We'll be back next week with an all-new edition of On the Mark. Everything looks
words in black and white. Code of chrome. 